Hey guys, welcome to Wooly Wednesday. This show was recorded live on January 30th, I think it's today. Um, and we are doing an intro to wet felting. So if that interests you, make sure to stop for a second and click the subscribe button wherever it is. And then this is the full recording of that show. Catch us live on Wednesdays at two o'clock central on facebook.com slash living felt. But let's jump right into our lesson. Hi, I'm Kayla. Hi, I'm Ann. Hi, I'm Hannah. Hi, I'm Marie, and we are coming to you live from Austin, Texas, because it's Happy Wooly Wednesday! Hey, everybody, happy Wednesday, and burr! Oh, it's so <laughs> chilly. We have been talking to some of our friends around the country today, and someone I talked to it was negative 25 oh, wind no. chill factor. No. <laughs> It's pretty good. What's it here, y'all? 40s? About, yeah. yeah 50s. It so like it's it. warm here. Y'all could come down here if you want. <laughs> <laughs> We're so glad to be with you today. We are doing an uh, introduction to wet felting. What are you teaching, Hannah? What am I teaching? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of everything. <laughs> I put her on the spot. I'm just teasing. These girls have been working so hard getting all your orders out so we know that there's like this polar vortex happening right now and the packages are still leaving. U.S. Mail reports they're still moving things in that direction and for everybody else who has some sunshine let's just blow it towards our friends. <laughs> we want you to know we're thinking about you yeah. guys. So we're going to have a tutorial today. What do you say we get us to get started? Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for being here everyone and welcome to Wooly Wednesday. This is what we like to do at least once a week is hang out with our friends for a live hour. This is meant to be interactive so we hope you'll chime in, ask questions, offer your contributions. I am going to refresh my screen so I can see you and what you should see is people saying hi and where they're from. So if this is your first Wooly Wednesday, say hi and let us know where you are. You might even tell us what the temperature is since it's so cold in so many places. We are based in Austin, Texas. We ship all over the world and you'll also see that we have friends just all over the world chiming in right now and thank you so much for being here. I'm going to refresh my screen and say hi to some people. Mm-hmm. All right. Yep. We've got Connie in Illinois, Martha in Florida, Alice from right here in Austin, Texas. That's so nice. Thank you all for being here so much. Oh, there we are. Okay. I'm refreshing and then I'm going to watch some, some people checking in. Uh, there's Cece Smith and there's Natasha in Ontario. Uh, Lydra in Knoxville, Tennessee, and our friend Sonia is there too. That's so nice of y'all to be here. So you know what, today we decided to just take it back and we're going to break down an introduction to wet felting. For those of you who have never wet felted, or those of you who are brand new beginners, or those of you who have kind of gotten started and you're, you're not very sure about your felt, our goal is for you to come away from today's session and make for your assignment, your fun work, a good piece of felt. We're going to look at some examples of what that might look like and what it might not. And we're even going to look at a variety of fibers that you can achieve that with. For people who already know how to make a good piece of felt, maybe the result of today will be for you that we offer you some insights of another way you might teach or phrase what you're teaching, or maybe you'll offer us some tips on how we can better convey the same concepts and ideas to help people. Web felting is so easy and it's so fun. I find that um, it's really easy to want to jump into a great big project and know sometimes we'll get people who call us and say they want to make you know a four foot wall hanging to go over the back of their sofa or even for a community project and they've never even touched fiber. And so what we want to do is encourage you to learn how to make good felt first, learn about your fiber and your tools, whatever you have, and use that as a skills builder and a samples library builder so that you know what to expect and you can make felt that fits your project. So we're going to look at a few projects. Um, okay, so anything I should address just yet, Anne? 
She says not yet. Okay, thank y'all for being here. So before we look at some samples really up close and personal, I want to just show you a few of the things in the room. And all of these things have a different purpose, different types of felt for different types of purpose. So this lovely wall hanging, some of you will recognize, this is made by Anna Repke, um, and this is now ours and lives at the shop, so you can visit it if you ever come visit us. She came last week and taught us uh, her method for wet felting sunsets, and man, the results were just outrageous. We have uh, reposted the video on YouTube, because apparently I had like a really long trail ending. Anyway, it's fixed. But this is a great example of what I mean by a purpose of your felt. So for this piece, this is light and delicate and doesn't need to be very thick because it can be framed, whether it's matted on a canvas like we looked at a few weeks ago or even hung behind glass. But it doesn't need to be too thick. It doesn't need a lot of weight to it. For something like a cat cave, you might want it to be really durable and hold its body. For something like a tunic or a skirt or you might want them to be lightweight and drapey whereas a winter coat you might want it to be really thick and warm so we want you to think about the different purposes of your felt for a purse or even a hat you might want it to have a lot of body and be very stiff um, or for a scarf you might want it to be light and drapey all of these things can be felted and still well felted, but have different characteristics. So the type of fiber you use, how much fiber you use, and the amount of fiber you use is going to be different depending on that project. Good? Make sense? So let's break it down. We're not going to talk the whole time, but let's break it down and talk about that a little bit. There's a question that comes up often that asks, does direction matter when you're laying out fiber? And our answer is it matters when it matters. So fiber is going to shrink in a particular direction based on a number of factors. One is the direction of the fiber. And so I want you to know it absolutely does matter how you lay fiber out. An example is this tunic. This tunic has fiber laid out in multiple directions depending on how we want it to shrink. So if you want something to shrink more in this direction, you can lay more of your fibers going this way. And the fibers tend to shrink back in the length of their staple, which is the, the staple is the length of the fiber. In the breast section, we tend to lay it out almost in a circular pattern so that there's a little bit of ease so that it doesn't bind the breast but gives when you, the wearer puts it on. And around the waist and the hips, we might do crisscross or there's more of a diagonal layout so that it shrinks less. So the way you lay out fiber does impact even if it's a batting, and we're going to look at some examples up close and personal. So when you think about a purpose of a garment, you want it to fit and you want it to be more fitted in some areas and looser in others. So you may change the way you lay out your fibers. If you're doing something like a picture, even if you start with batting as a base, if you lay out your, um, if you lay out your imagery, in the wet felting stage, like you're going to do the whole thing wet felted, maybe it has trees and a house, you want to control that shrinkage so that the image looks like you intended for it to look. So here's a quick example and then we're going to break it down and look at some felted examples. Okay? And it gives me the thumbs up. Alright, so here's an example of a, of a picture that I got off the internet. This is someone's drawing. I'm going to look up where I got this because I meant, I meant to put the artist. Um, so this is a drawing just of a house and mountains and some trees in the back. Let's say this was your goal, an 11 by 8 picture. You wanted the mountains to span this way and the house to be this way. If your picture shrinks more in the up and down because of how you laid out the fibers or because of how you felt it, this is what you'll get instead, is like a squatty picture. Your picture gets more squatty and will distort. You may not mind so much on a landscape, but what if it was a face? If it was a face or an animal, it would really change how it looks. And this is an example of it shrinking more this way and getting kind of squashed. So you're gonna to wanna to learn to control shrinkage 
when it matters. If it's an abstract or a piece you're gonna cut and sew, then you just want the felt to fit that end purpose. Does that make sense? Okay, any questions so far? Anne says not yet. Okay, so we're gonna jump into some little more um, tangible examples. We're gonna look at a few different types of fiber and how uh, they're felted. We're gonna look at tools and we're actually gonna felt. So my goal is for no matter what fiber you have that you go away, not go away, <laughs> you go to your homework and you make yourself a piece of really good felt. I have a variety of samples here on the table. The first purpose is to say, it doesn't matter what fiber you have in your stash right now, I hope that you will pull that out after today's lesson and felt yourself what you think is a good piece of felt. The first example I brought is, uh, these are all felted with our MC1 batting. Some of you have worked with that. We love it for needle felting. We use it for wet felting, all manner of things. Uh, I like it for slippers also. Um, and these pieces are three different types of pieces. If you're really, really toe in the water, you might check out our wet felting a bookmark video, which is essentially making something that looks kind of like this. We also did this last year. We wet felted um, backgrounds for doing greeting cards. And I looked at it, we did a real quick video and we wet felted this piece. So when we have felted something to a nice degree, this is medium felted, I would say. It's not hard felted because I could still stretch it a little bit. But I want you to notice that I couldn't pick it apart. I mean, it is a piece of fabric. It's not getting fluffed up in my hands or roughed up in my hands. You can cut it to a shape. Uh, and we've even incorporated some other fibers and yarns and this is a fabric and yarns in there. And this is what we make our bookmarks with. We used the same basic thing just to needle felt a little daisy picture last year. So the idea was to make a background. This is an example of that stuff not felted. And that means I could kind of pull it apart. See how it kind of comes apart in my hands and it's all lofty and loose? This would pill a great deal if I tried to put it into action. If you're putting it behind glass or sticking it up on a wall, that's one thing. But if something is too fuzzy and you put it on the wall like art, it's gonna collect more dust and it's a little bit more difficult to clean. So our goal is to get something really well felted that you could cut and that will not just rough up and pill in your hands. Okay? And gives me a thumbs up. If, if we're going through things and you want to see anything uh, back again, let me know. Now, on the same, sticking with the solid examples, these are two completely different fibers. One is a 19 micron merino top, and this one is like a 30 micron uh, crossbreed. The thing about these is when you think about purpose, it might be how does it feel next to the skin? Or how does this thing pill over time with action? Something made with a 19 micron short fiber bat is likely to pill more than something made with merino top. Merino top uh, has a longer staple length. This is an example of the staple length, whereas a short fiber bat is actually sometimes been cut and sometimes it's a different kind of merino, which is just very short. The more short ends, the more likely it is to pill. So when you think about you, the purpose of your item, you might also think about the quality of the felt. How does it feel in your hands? Does it feel durable? Does it pill? Do you like how well you're, how easily it felt or how difficult it felt? Um, and making samples is a great way to kind of play with different fibers and also see how much they shrink. Shrinkage can be really important, especially if you're making something like we shared, like a tunic or a hat, or even a wall hanging that you want to stretch, you want to know how much something will shrink. We have a shrinkage calculator online, which is designed to be like a skills builder. So you can start with a square and then go to a trapezoid, which might be like a skirt, um, or even a tunic for that matter, or a hat, uh, and then get to more complex shapes. 
And that's for people who use Excel. Otherwise, you can just you know use your little calculator on your phone or whatever. But I want you to think about making a sample to evaluate the quality of the felt and how it feels in your hands. Once you kind of get to that point, you can also start to play with different design elements. These are examples from a felt, a felt along we did over a year ago now, where I think it was over a year ago, where it was like, I don't know, one or two hours in the evening, we all felted live together. And what we did is we added different design elements into our work, just so you could see how they behave. So it really was a samples class. And these are, um, these are mohair locks, and this is a wool lock. Silk hankies are in here, uh, Angelina fibers. So you can always make yourself a little test swatch and see, how do I like my colors together? How well do these fibers play together? Um, and like, for example, I was talking with Anne before the show, when you're designing something like a purse, or I mean like a tunic or a dress, you don't want these around the breast area. You certainly don't want them right around the neck area. So even when you're designing a scarf, you might think of the placement of some of your design elements. Um, we did a like a multiples resist class last year too. So depending on your design elements, the shrinkage may change depending on how much stuff you glob on there. Like I said, it doesn't matter unless it matters. But doing little samples like this is a great um, action to take when you're planning a bigger project. The other thing I want to cause you to think about, uh, these are made with pre-felts. Uh, I thought I had another one here, is that fiber migrates, these are samples, and if y'all, if this interests y'all, we could do this as a class sometimes together, sometime together online. I did this as a live class here in the shop. Um, this is all made with our fine merino prefelts and different types of resists. But the reason I brought it in today is to, so you can think about how both fabrics and fibers interact with each other. These have, uh, these two have a thin layer of silk chiffon gauze over the top of these different design elements. So you can see how a fabric impacts the pure color that's underneath. But also important to note is that fiber migrates both directions. So you see here where the black very clearly came through the white coming back both ways. So when you design something, uh, know that your base fibers can come up through the top. And if you make a sample, you can evaluate whether you like the marriage of the fibers that you're bringing together. Do you like what they do together? They might change the color. We call this a halo when the fibers come through the other side. Sometimes it's white coming through your black. So making a sample, I think, can be really, really helpful to uh, help you evaluate and just play even. Just play. And a lot of our felting friends would love a class. Y'all like this? The You like the black and whites kind of thing? You mean like this? I think it was a, a couple minutes earlier when you asked uh, if you guys are, are more interested in this, we can do this. Like this one? the Because this is the one I thought, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me know if you want to do a, a live class, whether it was this or one of the other samples that I showed so far. Once you kind of get the hang of, you know, what a good felt feels like, then you're going to get braver to endeavor and try new things. Both of these kooky things were made with the cracked mud technique. And did we find, there was an old, I know that there's at least a picture tutorial in our group, Facebook for Living Felt Friends, on doing the cracked mud technique. Um, and this is just a play on that. There's so many ways you can go, but these are just some fun variations. And my encouragement is learn to make a good piece of felt that you can cut first. So I'm gonna show you one more a set of samples and then we're going to jump to something looking at shrinkage. Okay, on this set of samples, these are nano felt samples. And so what we have here is a this was like a thrift store silk with yellows and oranges and I was evaluating how did the floral pattern change. I don't even know what this flower is, a rose or something. Um, I wanted to see how did the floral pattern change when I felted it and do I like it? 
Um, and sometimes you buy like a mystery fabric at the thrift store and you don't know whether it's silk or whether it would work. So you can make little samples and see this puckers nicely and this Harley puckers and this two colors I don't like. <laughs> how they play together. These are actually two different types of silk. One's a habitai and one's a, a gauze or chiffon. So um, you can mark your samples and save little bits and ask yourself, do I like this before you, or does it, do they even felt together before you lay out a whole big shawl and decide that you absolutely hate it? Um, and lastly, I've shared these pieces before. These are just two examples of one piece felted and one piece not felted. This is actually semi-felted to what we would call a pre-felt. Pre-felts can be made by you or they can be machine made. They can be made with fine fibers or coarse fibers. Again, it's gonna depend on the purpose. The fine fibers, we often cut and make them into design elements. Um, like these pieces here. These are, these are pre-felt pieces underneath this. So um, I just wanted to show you, for example, a shrinkage difference and for you to see that you know a pre-felt could be cut to a shape, but potentially you could also kind of rip it apart. So if your felt is in this state, or if you can still see the grains of the fibers as they're running through there, it's probably not felted enough you don't want to be able to pick it apart. And we're going to look at how you evaluate that during the felting process. If you can felt it really well and you can still see the grains of the fibers, then you want to practice your layout a little more. And that means thinner and thinner layout. Okay, last thing on these sort of prefab samples, and then I'll let pause so y'all can ask me questions. I want to show you these two pieces. Um, one is more square and one is a little more rectangular. These are both made with our core wool batting. And I made these just for you today because the question often comes up, does it matter? Like, can you just lay down batting and it will shrink evenly in all directions? And I want you to know that when I first discovered batting, that's what I was told. That's what I learned. It didn't really matter. It is a very fast way to lay something out. Uh, for y'all don't know, this is, this is our core wool. This is what I felted it with. It's a big lofty bat. I'll take this apart so the fairies can relabel it. <laughs> it's a big lofty bat. We sell it in an eight ounce increment. Uh, we do have a fiber preparations video for those who are not familiar with what I'm talking about, but this gives you an idea. This is the stuff that I felted this with. Here's what I did. I took one ounce of this big fluffy stuff and I laid it out into an eight inch square. Same on both pieces. One piece, this piece, I just laid the bat down in its one direction. Bat, a bat, even though uh, how a bat is made is all the fibers, they're like little locks or whatever size locks, they just go into this hopper and then up on a great big drum carter. So in a sense, the fibers are all mixed up and they make this big beautiful bat. You, but when you look at it, you can kind of see there's a grain and it runs this direction. The tendency is just to lay this down and felt whatever. But if you remember the house example we gave just a minute ago, what would happen if you were doing that landscape scene here is it would be squashed. I put this marker to indicate this was the direction of the fibers and I only laid them down in one direction. And this, by the way, was stacked to about three inches before I started felting it. Uh, because I laid it out in this eight inch square right here. What happens when you get it wet is the fibers spread out because all that girth has to go somewhere. And when this was wet, it was 10 by 10. So what we see here is it's approximately eight inches here and it's actually still, uh, I'll turn this around, is 10 inches this way. So we lost two inches. Whereas this piece, I crisscrossed the layers and I mixed them up. And what we did was it shrunk down to nine inches 
and down to nine inches. So we still lost two inches, but we lost them equally. And I did everything I could to shrink this one more this way. And I just wanted to use this as a demonstration to say, you know, if it matters, go ahead and alternate the layers on your bat. Good? Anything coming up as a result of that, Anne? That I should look at, talk about? The only question we have on that right now is from Lydra, and she just asked how thick are those samples? Um, I can tell you that it's a one ounce sample and it's pretty thick. I could cut it um, so you can see and I'll try and hold it up to the camera. So I, you know, I kind of don't want to cut it because I'm showing the, <laughs> I kind of don't want to cut it because I'm showing the, um, the shrinkage actually. So I'll just tell you, Lydra, that this was done as uh, it was three inches to start and I squashed it all down. So whatever you have, it's definitely thick enough that you can't see through it. Hot enough to be a hot pad, that's for sure. But not thick enough for a cat cave. You know, it just doesn't have that much stiffness. See how it kind of is still a little limp. Okay. And uh, Lois shares, I love that demo, it helps. Um, Jenny shares, I love this info. <laughs> Oh, cool. Okay, I'm glad it's helpful. I cannot see y'all's comments, so Anne's just going to read them to me. And we are on a much longer delay than we usually are. Oh, okay. So then I'll just, we'll just be patient. Okay, so what we have here, this is just my work surface, which is one good old towel. And what we're going to do is we're going to lay out some fiber. I'm going to lay out some merino top, and we're going to look at the things you need for wet felting, which are pretty basic. So one thing I like is an old towel, two is fiber, three is a good olive oil soap. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the fiber we're gonna be felting today, which is like, I guess living cor coral is a really hot color this year, so this is what we're going to felt. And we're gonna do a bit of cooking show felt so that we can get to the fulling process. I'll explain that. Um, you need something to wet your fiber. You can use a bucket, you can use a bottle with Thank you, Anne. With holes drilled in the lid, you can use a ball brass. I like to use a sponge often, and if you felt it with me, you know that. And then what you need, um, hot water is really helpful, and agitators of some sort. So we're gonna look at a variety of agitators. These are your number one agitators. Felt is the finished product whether that product is a scarf like this one. Some of you felt it along with us. We did a free uh, wet felting a cobweb scarf video. Felt is the finished product and felting is the act of getting those fibers to start to interlock. The final stage is called fulling and there's a variety of ways to felt and a variety of ways to full. So when you look at some of the tools that you have to work with, some of them I think are more suitable for delicate felts and some are more suitable for really durable thick felts. So think about that when you pull your tools together and I'm gonna give you a quick example. This is just normal everyday small bubble wrap. We sell it in the shop as a matter of convenience under, um, what do we call it, lightweight resist or what? A small bubble resist. S small bubble resist. You can use this as a resist. This is what I use to make my big skirt hanging on the wall. Or you can use it as a agitator. In the, and in that case, you can put it on the bottom or top or sandwich your work, whatever. We also have something called super bubble, which is thicker more durable. It's like the spa cover. Uh, you see us using it blue a lot, but we decided to get clear so it doesn't sort of compete with your designs. This is a more aggressive agitator. If I'm going to do anything thicker than a thin delicate, I jump to this stuff because I really like the resistance it gives me when I'm felting against something. You often see people felting with a pool noodle. So I'm going to pull out some of these type roller bar agitators and let's talk about them for a quick second. Let's look at, let's just look at these things right here. Okay. 
For the moment, I want you to think of these. These are agitators and they're felting tools. If I'm going to felt something delicate I, or something that has a lot of girth, I might start at first with a pull noodle because it's bigger. But if it's delicate, I'm going to choose it because it's softer. For something like a nice delicate scarf, I'm not going to use something like these awesome Nikki and Nikki tools unless I use it through the bubble wrap because it's very aggressive and has very sharp edges cut into it. Whereas this beautiful handmade tool by Heartfelt Silks, which we also carry, these bumps are a lot more gentle and we still use it in the beginning through a barrier, um, but this is a lot more gentle than these sharp teeth. So I also use like a pull noodle and sometimes we use bamboo, but I want you to think about these as being graduated in aggressiveness, maybe like knives in your kitchen. This might be like a butter knife that you would use to spread peanut butter or cut a banana. This might be more like a steak knife and these guys, which are a lot more aggressive, this might be like what you would cut a watermelon with. This is a pretty heavy duty tool. And this one is in the middle. Bamboo can be very aggressive. Um, so if you're felting MC1 or New Zealand Corydell or something like that, or if you're in the final stages, even a felting, just a thick piece of merino, I would use it. But if I'm doing a nano felt with delicate silks, I would use the bubble wrap. Um, even the super bubble or this tool right here. So I want you to evaluate the tools a little bit as far as aggressiveness. Is that helpful or is that too much information? No, it's great. So if I'm doing a wall hanging that I want to felt really stiff, I'm not going to use this the whole way with, with bubble wrap. I'm going to switch over at some point and use one of these two guys and really dig in there because the layers are really thick and you want to bring all the layers together. And having a real hard core or a real strong tool to push back against is really helpful. So at the minimum, get yourself some bubble or super bubble if you want to try it, a closet pole cut to size, and a pull noodle and start there. All the rest of the tools are fancy and fun and if you're a tool junkie like me, well then have at it. <laughs> and Stephanie asks, do the wooden tools really do a lot better than the bubbles? When you're needing to felt something hard, yes. Like if I want to hard felt my slippers, I'm going to pull out the wooden tools on the fulling stages. So let's look at what that means before I run out of time. <laughs> to felt. We're going to felt some merino top. We're going to felt, uh, which is a very delicate fiber. This is 19 microns. And when you first start, what I want to encourage you to do, one, we're going to make samples, right? What did I do? If we're going to make samples, I want you to start with a measured size. I usually cut out a piece of resist or something, uh, something that I can see underneath my plastic so that I have a starting size. In this case, I'm going to go to, let me turn this the other way, I'm going to make this like an 8 by 8 And the reason we do that is, somebody throw up the answer, why do we start with a measured size when we're making a sample? I'm going to divide this. Anne's, we're on a delay, so Anne's going to tell me when someone responds. If you have wool, when you buy it, you usually buy it by weight. Before you go to felt your piece, divide it in half, especially if it's like this. Fold it in half, tear it apart. If it's difficult to tear apart, just back your hands up and it'll come apart easily. So you want to divide it in different lengths, but then you can also divide the thickness. I have a one ounce piece here and we won't get too far. I'll just lay out a few layers. But notice that I divided that half. I'm going to fold this up. I'm going to divide it again and I'm going to show you why. I used to be very heavy handed in my layout and I just didn't know any better. I learned on paper from books and I just didn't have any idea. Um, I just kind of found my way, if you will, and I didn't really know any better until I got into it a little bit and started evaluating my felt. So you want to divide it really thin such that one hand you can control and keep the fiber flat. 
This hand I like to pull against my palm and people have different ways of laying out but when you lay out you want to be able to control that thickness. You want a nice thin piece and you want a uniform thickness as you are pulling off. So where's my, my 8 inch mark? I'm going to go to about right here. I'm going to start right here and we're going to make a layer of fiber I'm going to lay out across. So I'm going to lay out by gently overlapping each piece. I like to go across, sort of facing myself, and there's just a slight overlap with each piece. Guardian, a lot of our felting friends guessed the um, the purpose <laughs> of the starting off with, with defined measurements. Wendy Taylor was the first to Whoops. calculate trinkets. <laughs> That's right. To calculate trinkets, I've already gone over. I forgot I'm making a little piece. Okay, I'm going to make an eight by eight. Okay, so I'm going to make an 8 by 8 I'm going to go here to here, and when we go across this next layer, you want to go, you can go about half or a third up the, the previous row that you created. Every time you lay something out, you kind of, fl I flick it a little bit because you don't want these little ends to curl underneath themselves. And if you're unsure, like if it seems a little uneven, just peel that off and like what you lay down if you feel like you got a little too much. More thin, even layers are better than great big bulky layers. And like I said, I, I didn't know that in the beginning. I probably would cringe if I watched back some of my old videos <laughs> of how I laid stuff out, but I didn't know. So I guess I just knew, I knew what I knew up to that point. We all know what we know up to that point. So nice, thin, even layers as much as possible. If you pull something off, and if you pull something off and it starts to get separated, uh, like it starts to get a split between the fibers like that, just get it organized again and lay it down. You can always lay down two little shingles if you need to. Um, but remember that you're in control of the fiber and making little samples like this will give you good practice it can also familiarize you with a fiber, like how easy it to lay out, lay out or pull off. Now, notice that I've been kind of laying this way. When I get to this end line, I'm gonna be right here, I tend to kind of go backwards because this is the more wispy end, the more uneven ends, and this ends a little more straight where I pulled it off. So I tend to kind of flip when I'm on that last row backwards. The more even your layers are, the more even your finished felt will be. And remember, you can always pull off little bits if you want to shore that up. So we've gone this way, now we're going to go this way. I encourage you to think of an even number of layers. So if you're doing something like batting as a base layer and merino top as a design layer, just try and remember the direction, you know, as you lay things down. I noticed uh, when I did my first landscape, the first time I did something where I wanted my picture to be horizontal, that it came out squashed like we were talking about before. It shrunk more to a square when I wanted it to be horizontal. And what I realized was, although I had alternated the base layers of my batting, one layer going this way and one layer going this way, my whole design layer was going this way. So I had more pull in this way and the picture ended up more square. So if you're doing a picture, like a landscape, and you think you're gonna have more of your design running horizontal, give yourself three base layers so that you counter that directional pull of the fibers. Does that make sense? I like, I, I, I share that often um, because it was just such an eye-opening lesson for me. Okay, 
what's most important, and I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap off wrap up this laying out here real fast because I know we're gonna run out of time for our tutorial. Uh, we'll felt this to some degree, and then we'll talk about finishing it. What's really important is that you get your layers even in the layout stage as much as possible. This is where you want to feel and make sure everything is even, you don't have any gaps and you don't have any holes, is in the layout, in the layout stage. So take your hands and press it across your pile and feel. Are there any holes? Are there any little bare spots? And if there are, just drop another little piece of fiber on there. And if you do that at every stage, not just at the end, you're gonna catch the bare spots early and fill them in. One of our felting friends asked, do, in general, do finer fibers shrink more in depth than coarser fibers? Oh, you mean in the... Like in height. Oh, in height. That's really going to depend a lot on how you felt. And I know that might be a little bit of a mind bender, um, but if you pile up something really big, if you pile up something really big and you do a lot of rolling, you're more likely to shrink it in this way. If you pile up something really big and you do a real, real, real gradual compression and very gradual massaging, you're gonna shrink it even more in depth. And something that we don't often think about is the actions we take in the early stages impact the overall shrinkage. So if I were to, we know that usually when we felt, we felt an even number of times from all directions. But if I were to felt 100 times in this direction, spin it all the way around, and 100 times in this direction, I'm gonna already have impacted it more this way. So I'm gonna say, play with that. You know, you can compare your own thicknesses, but every project's gonna be different. And these fibers tend to be lengthened, uh, like a fine merino top tends to be lengthened, but other merinos are already short. So I think that it's probably too broad of something to answer. You know what I mean? Okay, so what we have is our, our fiber all laid out, and I've put down a barrier. Oh, I'm going to switch. I'm going to switch, actually. I like this as a barrier. This is our mesh. I use it all the time. I'm going to start with a piece of plastic. Um, because a lot of people feel a little more comfortable. This is very thin 0.7 mil plastic. This is a great barrier for your hands. So we're going to wet out our piece. Uh, a barrier is what you put over the top so that the wet fiber doesn't stick to your hands. So a lot of people use plastic and I use mesh and here's why. I like to press the water and the soap right into the fiber press from the middle and work the water out. I don't pock all over the place, especially if you're making something thick like our wall hangings last weekend. You want to really control the flow of water from the inside out. What's the What's this kettle water? You want to control the flow of water from the inside out. The thicker it is, the more you're going to notice how that matters, but also if it's really long, Okay, when I felt, and this is just the way I felt, it's just the way I learned, the first thing I like to do is form a surface skin. The surface skin is a very flat hand and my hand's just gliding across the surface. Just sort of getting that top to sear itself together. You want to be so gradual that no fibers are shifting underneath and they are not sticking to your mesh. They shouldn't be pilling up through the mesh. If you see it pilling, starting to ball up, then you're going too hard. Just add soap to your hands and massage. And go ahead and massage like an even number of times, meaning like this way for a couple of minutes, this way for a couple of minutes, in circles. If you're felting something super thick, it's gonna take more effort. If you're felting over a resist, it's gonna take more effort. And that's why I say, start small. I think of it like when you teach a kid to cook. When you first started to cook, 
the first thing you baked wasn't a wedding cake. Probably the first thing you made was more like eggs or pancakes. So we're gonna call this the pancake lesson. I want everyone to learn how to make a really good pancake. And then you can work yourself up to the wedding cake. <laughs> so that's my, that's my suggestion. Start small and learn how to make a good felt first. Educate your hands into how it feels as a fiber progresses and goes from mushy and loosey-goosey like this to a really good felt. So once you kind of have a surface skin formed and we have like all of the air out, again, it's a thin project so we get there fast, then we're gonna roll. If you're new and you're concerned about uh, your fiber sticking to the mesh, then you can switch to the thin plastic. Some people um, just love rubbing through this plastic and some people don't like it. Some people even wet out with the plastic, so you'll see that on videos too, that instead of the mesh, they just use this and they push the water through. What you wanna do if you're working with the mesh is get the top of the plastic wet and your hands soapy so that you can rub all over. You could felt something 100% just rubbing with your hands. You absolutely could, and I've done it with a very large wall hang. Well, very, I don't know, 40, over 40 inches wide, and I don't know, how many pounds did we say that thing weighs? Four pounds or something? I think about four pounds of fiber. And it was just rubbing, 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 rubbing. So you could felt just this way, and you could also just roll. The plastic is just good uh, if you, maybe are concerned about being too aggressive. I'm gonna spin this around and we're actually gonna use our pull noodle. Should I take any questions, Anne? We're doing okay. Furrowed brow, she's thinking. Here's what I, I have a little rolling towel and I'm gonna show you how I use this. So I'm gonna roll up my piece around the bubble wrap. I'm gonna roll it all the way tight. And what you want is this to stay in place. You can use fabric ties to hold it in place, but sometimes if the project is small, I just use another towel or a sheet or something like that. Something that will just kind of help me lock it down. Rolling is a form of agitation and this is the felting process. So I'm just gonna demonstrate this real quick and we're gonna jump to a sample that I've already been working on. You'll see in books and a lot of traditional uh, felting classes that we kind of roll from elbows to fingertips like this. When you have a small project, you can also roll like this and you wanna learn to count. This is how I usually count, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Quarter turn. So when you see me say quarter turn on your axis, this is what I mean. So a new part is laying down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, one, two, three, four, five. If you do this so that you roll a hundred times from this direction, what you will do is unroll it, be gentle. Oh, your plastic might get stuck. Get your plastic, unroll it, and then you're gonna give your project a quarter turn. So if you have plastic or if you have mesh, you can peel it back. If you have plastic, you can lift the whole thing. Give it a quarter turn and do your 100 rolls from all four of these edges. Then you will flip it over and repeat. And that's really important to flip it over and repeat. And Carla asks, if you're using the mesh to wet felt with, can you also roll with the mesh or is it too rough? I roll with the mesh all the time. I only suggest no, don't press down hard in the beginning and peel back each time you unfurl your project. I use the mesh all the time. I love the mesh. So here's what I want to call your attention to. When you're rolling, no matter what your core is, whether it's bamboo or a closet pole or whatever, you wanna get no wrinkles in your piece and you want it to stay round. If this starts getting sloppy and flat and it's like shifting while you roll it, unroll it and start over. So just remember, you're gonna roll 100 times from each direction, then flip it over and do it again, and then evaluate your felt. 
So remember, we're just making a sample here, nothing fancy, not a bunch of design. I want everyone to learn to make a really good felt. So let me get the piece that I was felting before you all came. I'm gonna set him off to the side somewhere. This piece was much bigger. I started out 12 by 12. And like I said, it doesn't matter whether you rub, whether you roll, whether you do both. You want to get to a point where your fiber is like a bit of a fabric, even if it's still delicate. That means if I pinch it, the pinch test is like, if I pinch it, it's going to tent up, as opposed to me being able to do this and pick fibers apart. If you can pick fibers apart, continue felting. This is considered a soft felt. You could go any direction you want at this point. You could even start to shape it over a bowl or you know, start getting it to become something else. Or you could really kick it up a notch and increase your agitation. Some people never switch to the super bubble. I love the super bubble. <laughs> I love the super bubble. What I wanna show you is a few different ways to full once you get to this point. So one is, you could roll, where's my, you could roll just on your closet pole. You could get to a point where this is nice and flat and you're just pressing and rubbing and pressing and rubbing. These bubbles are pushing against and you're pressing against this closet pole. Just remember to count and pay attention to the shrinkage that's happening. So rolling on something more narrow, you could also roll on itself. You can, I call this like pinch and roll, a pinch and roll, a pinch and roll, and pinch and roll. If you're being so aggressive that your fiber is starting to pill, then back it off and go to a more gentle approach. But the pinch and roll is really good for things like, you see this corners kind of sticking up out here a little bit? If you have a corner or something that you want to get to shrink in, then grab a hold of it and pinch it in. And you can even just rub that part just by itself. We would kind of call this spot fulling. And can you see how fast that corner came in? That corner came in compared to this corner. You can also rub and like coax something to come in with a directional pull, if you will. Whatever you do, the direction of the fibers, how many layers of fibers, the fineness of the fibers, and the agitation that you provide in the felt making stage as well as the fulling stage are going to contribute to that shrinkage. If you get too much shrinkage in some point that you don't want, you could just go back and give it a little tuck. When you see it, give it a tuck. So another method of fulling is called palming. I especially like this when I want to get my fabric feeling, the, the layers feeling closer together. If you go like this to your fabric, no matter how thick it is, a wall hanging, boots, hat, a purse, and you can feel those layers shifting between each other, you need to get them to bind more together. So you can do this palming. And I like to do it all over. In something like a cat cave, I'm up to my elbows in this thing. Here's what I want to tell you. There's lots of methods for fulling and felting and making stuff, but if you start to build your skills on thin little pieces like this, then the rest is going to come, come gradually and you'll understand the fiber more and more as you work with it. My goal here is to make a piece of fabric that's durable enough that I can cut it and sew it into a pillow or something like that. So we've looked at rolling, we've looked at rubbing, we've looked at what I call the, the pinch and scrunch, and we've looked at palming. Other methods for fulling include, I call this wadding. Wadding, you really start to change the direction of things. So I wouldn't do any wadding until your felt is really progressing. If you do this too early, you're really going to rough it up. Some people do hot and cold rinses and some people swear against it. It's considered shocking the fibers. Throwing, like wadding it up, it's wet, and throwing it is also a way of shocking the fibers. Some people hate it. 
Some people do it in the dryer. They would take their wet piece and roll it around something and then put it in the dryer without heat and let it bang. That's the same idea. If you put something in the dryer, either plan to lose all control of the shrinkage or control it by rolling it up around something and binding it before you do it because it really does t tend to cause the fibers to crimp and if you don't bind the shape, then you could really lose control of how it shrinks. Don't throw it in the washing machine because it's going to pill. It's not like something that's been knitted. Uh, and then fold. This is the folding stage, so I wouldn't throw it in the washing machine unless you really felted the heck out of it and you're making it for something that you intend to wash and shrink. So what am I not thinking of in the fulling? Right, well, um, someone asked, is there a certain amount of shrinkage that the product you need to have to, for it to be considered in the fulling stage? Um, no, because all your fibers are going to be different. The thicknesses are going to be different. I would say start to learn if you take the fiber that you're working with and if you felt it to the degree that the fabric meets the quality you need for the end project, then you measure that shrinkage and you give yourself a target. But the key is you got to use basically the same fibers, the same layout, and the same layers you know, of fiber to know what that shrinkage is. On something that's 100% merino, you could get 50 or more percent shrinkage or you could get 30% shrinkage and still have a good felt. Like my skirt, in some areas it was shrunk 50% and other areas 30, but that was planned in advance with the layout. So I would say that's it's not that cookie cutter, but the, the good thing to know is what's the felt, the quality of the felt. If you think you're there, rinse it and set it overnight and then check the quality the next day. The first rinse is always really telling, but the next day is really, really telling. Most of the time, you definitely could keep going. And my goal today, again, is just to get you all making one good piece of blank, <laughs> plain felt that's a really good quality that you now have a target you could shoot for. I think that's all I have. <laughs> Quickie, I know, but... <laughs> Long, long and drawn out nonetheless. So we're going to turn the cameras up and I know we're out of time, but I'll see if there's any questions I can answer. Question Sherry J says, if you're using this as a piece of pre-felt, would you stop at some point? So the answer is absolutely yes. If you're trying to make pre-felt and you might use your same fiber and make a piece of pre-felt first, just use like two very thin layers and maybe roll it like a hundred times and that's it. And a very gentle process. With a pre-felt, you just need it holding together. But I would say still test it. So cut it, uh, you know, test that pre-felt if the project really matters. And that is to make the pre-felt, let it dry, cut it, and then incorporate it into another sample and see how do the fibers play together and how do you like it. And um, someone says, I don't know. I can't read Kate. Kate Housley posted about something. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is watch for your questions after. And I know, again, so many of you are really well experienced and others of you are just, just beginning. So I'm just going to offer one more tip. On these two samples that I made, notice that I marked them. This one, I put a up and down line to show uh, what was the grain of the fibers, but I also put it on the top so that I could count how many times I had rolled from an edge as well as a side. And pay attention to where that is in case you stop and start, the kids interrupt you, it's time to go make dinner, whatever your best friend calls. And the same thing here, I didn't make the uh, the crisscross identical by you know by needle felting it or using pre felts because I wanted to recognize the characteristics of the cross so I could count and make sure I was really giving you all a really fair uh, test sample so that you could see. Um, yeah, okay. Well, I appreciate you all so much for being here. I hope it's helpful. I feel like I've been a bit long-winded, so the fairies are giving me the hook, and they're coming back to give away some prizes. For those of you who don't know, everyone who contributes during the show, your name goes into a bowl, and we give away prizes at the end. So we have some really fun prizes today. We're excited to give away. Come on in, gals. We got two of the three resident fairies. <laughs> 
And we're gonna draw some names. How about I hold, y'all awesome. draw. Okay. Perfect. I'll be the, the bounty. Do it. <laughs> Take one for the team. Let's make sure Anne's in there. Oh, Oop. yeah. <laughs> Get a shoulder. Mm -hmm. All right, our first winner is Crystal Hutz. Yay, Crystal! What's she win, Anne? Crystal, you won a goodie bag of our short fiber merino bags. Awesome. Those are super fun. Now, we did a video a year ago, sometime last year, on how to wet felt beads fast, and we used these short fiber merino bats. And you could also make a picture with them or play with them, but they felt super, super mm -hmm. fast. So bookmarks, jewelry, anything. They're really, really fun. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Tradesies. Tradesies. <laughs> All right. <laughs> she doesn't look. She makes sure she's not <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, sorry, Butler. Sorry, mm -hmm. yay! What you win, Anne? Sorry, you went one a specialty designer pack. Ooh. So our specialty designer packs include all kinds of fibers from several of our lines, including some delicious luster fibers to play with, and it would really be a great pack to even build off this lesson today, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And colors. Okay, one big one left. Who's gonna win it? Ready? Go for it. Oh, I can shoot. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Whoop. Barbara Rosenthal. Yay, Barbara! What's she win, Anne? Barbara, you win one of our wet felting tools bundles. Woo! -hoo! Awesome. And that is actually this guy right back here, sand the bucket. Mm -hmm. So in our wet felting tools bundle, you're gonna get some resist, some bamboo, soap, a ball to felt over, a mesh, a ball bras, all that kind of good stuff. So hopefully those will be some fun prizes to play with. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you have fun playing with your felt making experience and I look forward to your feedback. Let us know whether this video was helpful, what we could do better, what you want to learn next time, and we'll read all your comments, I promise. Okay, you guys stay warm. Bye. Bye. Hey guys, thanks for watching today. We hope this was helpful. Please leave us your feedback so below. Let us know what we could do better. Let us know your contributions to this lesson and let us know what else you would like to learn. You can always catch this live on Facebook on Wednesdays at two o'clock central, but we hope you'll subscribe and follow us on YouTube and check us out anytime we upload a new video. Thanks for watching y'all. We appreciate you.